What a privilege to be with you. We've all been in the pandemic, and obviously those who are medical workers, the doctors and the nurses, have been the heroes. But for many of us, you as teachers are the real unsung heroes. And when we get back to normal, I think people will realize again how much you are the heroes. So I'm very privileged to be able to speak to you and add to this series for teachers. I first came to this country in 1968 as a visitor. It was the Annus Calamitosis, the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, and a hundred American cities were burning. 2020, in some ways, is the year of the black swans. Who would have thought on January the 1st the unknown unknowns that we'd be seeing? But here we are, and I'm speaking to you actually from July the 4th weekend. America is as deeply divided as at any time since just before the Civil War. And I want to start with the crisis but go on to what I think is the calling and the responsibility and the privilege for those of you who are teachers in America and in the classical and Christian schools at this moment. Why the division? Some say it's the social media or the social inequities or the coastals, California, New York, against the heartlanders in the Midwest or the nationalists and populists over against the globalists like George Soros who believe in a borderless world. All those things play their part. But I believe the deepest division is deeper still. It's between those who understand the republic and freedom from the perspective of the American Revolution, 1776, and those who understand it from the perspective of the French Revolution, 1789, and its heirs. Because if you think of the developments that have gone through this country in the last 50 years, postmodernism, multiculturalism, political correctness, tribal politics, identity politics, the sexual revolution, currently the rage for socialism, and behind it all what's called critical theory. All of those are ideas which flow down from the heirs of the French Revolution not the American Revolution. Now, the French Revolution lasted only 10 years, and Napoleon came in as dictator and said, the revolution is over. So I'm not talking about France. But if you think of the 19th, 20th, 21st centuries, the streams like lava from the volcanic explosion of 1789 have flown out with a revolutionary faith in three main ways. In the 19th century, it led to revolutionary nationalism, which helped unite Italy and Greece, and part of what lay behind secular Zionism and the later creation of the State of Israel. The second stream was designed in the 19th, obviously by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, but it was the stream of revolutionary socialism, communism, which burst through in the 20th century, principally in the Russian Revolution, 1917, and the Chinese Revolution in 1949, and I was there. We, of course, are in the 21st. And I suggest you, to understand the deep divisions, we have to look at what's called Western Marxism, revolutionary Western Marxism. Now, where did this come from, sometimes known as cultural Marxism? In the 1920s, Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist, sat in jail under Mussolini. In fact, he died in jail, trying to figure out why Marx didn't work out as he predicted. So he shifted Marxism from economic determinism to cultural domination. His ideas were picked up by the Frankfurt School, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then the 60s, with leading thinkers like Herbert Marcuse, who was so influential on the New Left. And it was he who called for the long march through the institutions. As I said, in 68, 
a hundred American cities were ablaze, and two leading assassinations. But the radicals realized they wouldn't win with a revolution in the streets. The long march through the institutions was how they intended to reach the colleges and universities, the press and the media, and the culture industry. In other words, the world of Hollywood and entertainment. And 50 years later, they've done it. And you think of all that we've seen in the universities and other places is the result of that long march through the institutions of a broad progressive left movement and behind it, critical theory, race studies, queer studies, LGBTQ+, and so on and so on. And that, I think, what's caused this deep division that we're seeing. Now, sadly, the big difference from the 1850s there is no Lincoln. What Lincoln did was to address the evil of the time, slavery, in the light of two things, the Declaration and what he called the better angels of the American character. A lot of people are talking about make America great again, but no one's addressing what made it great in the first place and how that relates to the current crises that we've seen especially since the brutal and horrific murder of George Floyd and how legitimate protests against genuine injustice led to violence and arson and looting and plain anarchy and lawlessness. But let me pick up what I think is your wonderful privilege and responsibility and calling as teachers in the schools today. Because obviously that's a key part of the American Revolution, but even more what lay behind it, what I call the Sinai Revolution. In other words, the way that the rediscovery of Exodus through the Reformation led to what became the English Revolution and then the American Revolution. Of course, the English Revolution failed. The king came back. It was called the Lost Cause. Whereas the American Revolution succeeded. It was the winning cause, but you can see behind both of them the rediscovery through the Reformation, Sola Scriptura, of what was called the Hebrew Republic. And the Hebrew Republic had a key place for teachers and for education. But let me go back to the Jews themselves. In 1899, in Harper's Magazine, there was a famous article by Mark Twain. All things are mortal, he said, except the Jews. All other forces pass. What is the secret of his immortality? Now, as you think of most nations, their identity, their strength, you think of land, a capital city, army, language, culture, and things like that. But the Jews lost them all. After AD 70 and then AD 133 with the massacre by the Romans and the destruction of Jerusalem, so that Jews weren't even allowed to go to the new city that was there, Elia Capitolina, they had nothing. No land, no capital city, no monarchy, no temple, no priesthood, no sacrifice. Everything that had made them Jewish had gone. So how did they survive? Well, put it another way. As the Jews themselves say, the Babylonians built ziggurats. The Egyptians built pyramids. The Greeks built the Parthenon. And Rome built the Colosseum. All of them expressing their greatness monumentally. But Jews built schools. Now, why was that? If you think for a moment, if you have any project, a personal one or a national one, any project that takes more than a single generation, you need education and you need transmission, or it won't last. And schooling is the secret, first, to identity, and secondly, to continuity. Again, what do the rabbis say? about Moses, the night of the Passover. Tonight, Passover night, 
they're going free. Hundreds of years of slavery, they're going to be liberated. Does he talk about freedom? No. They're going to the promised land, the land of flowing with milk and honey. Does he talk about the promised land? No. Three times Moses talks about children. He tells them, even before they'd become free, let alone escape from the land of slavery and bondage, he tells them how to tell the story of their freedom, because that will be the key to their identity and to their continuity. So, as the rabbis put it, Jews became a people whose passion was education, whose citadels were schools, and whose heroes were teachers. Now, let me expand on that a little in the light of four things that you can see in the Jewish history, all of which tell us something about our own challenge today. First, Judaism and the invention of the alphabet. Every invention is a huge lurch forward for humanity. But the knowledge explosions are a gigantic lurch forward. The invention of writing, the invention of printing in the 16th century, and the invention of the computer and the digital revolution in our own lifetime. But what I've missed out, of course, is the second and crucial one, the invention of the alphabet. So writing was incredibly important, but it was complicated. Whether you had cuneiform or hieroglyphs or pictograms in Mesopotamia or Egypt or China, there were hundreds of them, 600 possible pictograms in China. So naturally, with something that complex and that complicated, only the elite could master it. Writing was the preserve of the palace and the temple, not ordinary people. And that, of course, fitted an elite world, a structural world based on caste and based on power. But think of the extraordinary thing that the invention of the alphabet did. Less than 30 letters. And you may know that the first alphabet, the Proto-Semitic alphabet, was discovered in the same part of the Middle East where the Jews lived in slavery. Now you can see that the alphabet immediately makes learning more accessible to everybody, more simple, more portable, and essentially more democratic. And you have fascinating telltale examples even in the Bible. Take Judges, where Gideon wants to take back the, sit, the little town of Succoth, and he captures a teenage boy and asks him to write down the name of the leaders in the city. And the boy is able to write down more than 70 names. Just tiny passing telltale indication of literacy in ancient Egypt. And of course, that goes hand in hand. And not surprisingly, they are the people of the book. And as the Jews say, the Jews carried the Torah and the Torah carried the Jews. And part of that was to do with the simplicity and the democratic potential of the alphabet. Or take a second thing, the Jewish festivals. Go back to the ancient world and all the pagan world and festivals were tied in with fertility and therefore tied in with nature, including sex. The biblical festivals, the Jewish festivals, are different. They're tied in with history and they commemorate the great acts of God in history intervening in the lives of his people, the Jews. The Passover the liberation from Egypt, and so on, and so on, and so on. So again, that sense of identity, that sense of continuity, but they were celebrating God and his intervention in history, and you can see that the challenge, as they put it, was every young Jew in celebrating the festival was able to do so as, quote, as if they were there. 
In other words, they too were freed in the Passover and so on. And that's what gave them the continuity. And that's what fired that sense of identity. Festivals with a deep sense of history. Now, you know only too well, both Americans and sadly many American Christians have an appalling sense of history today. And you can see civic education has been thrown out of the public schools. And this is one of the reasons why there's a crisis. Not even our leaders know the history of this great country and what made America great in the first place. So it's true that the biographies of the founders, John Adams and others, or the play Hamilton, are incredibly popular. But we can read the books, but we can't resurrect the founders themselves. And many people don't realize what made America great. And this is a nation by intention and by ideas. So identity and history are incredibly important. Or take a third thing, the Jewish understanding of universal education. This came about by necessity. AD 70 was a terrible massacre. AD 133 was even worse. The two catastrophes in Jewish history before the Holocaust, the Shoah, in the 1940s. It was so bad that some of the rabbis in AD 133, even considered calling for no more sex in Jewish families, so the Jewish race could die out. But instead of that, they brought in, through the leadership of one rabbi, they brought in universal education for every Jew. They may have lost their capital, lost their capital city, lost their monarchy, and all the other things I mentioned. They had their synagogues, they had the rabbis, and they needed schooling. So every young Jewish child, six or seven, went through universal education as a Jew. Now that was 1800 years before Britain brought in universal education. And Britain was the first European nation, and America was considerably behind that. So the Jews had it all those many, many centuries before. As one of the rabbis said, and I love this, the world only survives by merit of the breath of school children. Isn't that great? The world only survives by the merit of the breath of school children. And that, of course, is your incredible privilege. Without you, faith wouldn't be handed on. Without you, American freedom wouldn't be handed on. But one more stress in Jewish experience, and that was they called, and they're not unique here, they called not only for textbooks in schools, but for teachers as text people. In other words, teachers didn't just teach in words and books and classes. They taught in life. Now, of course, in saying that, the Jews here are very close to the Greeks, Socrates and Plato. More importantly, they're very close to Jesus and his disciples. Think of Mark 3.14, where Jesus says, or rather, the gospel writer says, Jesus chose 12 to be with him to be sent out to preach. Being with him was the heart of discipleship. In other words, what you knights, the Jewish, the Greek, and the Christian view, is that there's more to knowing than knowing will ever know. So the deepest things can't be put in words. They can't be taught in classes or conveyed in a book or whatever. I'm a writer. They have to be learned in experience from a master under authority. Because the deepest things are even below what the master himself or herself can put into words. In other words, we need text people as well as textbooks. And I'm sure that's the greatness of the schools you're in and the ones I know are like that. And I'm so grateful for that from the 
principals and the headmasters and the headmistresses right down to the humblest teacher. Text people rather than textbooks. Let me summarize this if I can. I don't know if you remember the Beijing Olympics in 2008. They were unique in a lot of ways. There were many firsts. One of them, sadly, was there was no American runner on the podium in the relay races. Ever since relay running had been given medals, America had always had runners on the podium, usually gold medal winners. Now, of course, that year, 08, you had Usain Bolt, lightning bolt, as he was called, rather fast. So it wasn't surprising they didn't have gold medalists, but there were none. Why? They dropped the battle. They dropped the battle. And again and again, you heard the hollow, tinny sound of the baton dropped on the track in Beijing. Now, I have to say, sadly, that is the tragedy of America today, both in the church and in the country. In many, many areas, public schools, for example, transmission has broken down. The handing on, the passing of the baton. Thank God that the private schools, the Christian schools, the classical schools, and so on, have not dropped the baton. So your immense privilege and responsibility at this moment of national and Christian crisis is to so teach as text people to make sure that you are passing on the baton. What an extraordinary time we are living in the deepest crisis facing America, the crisis of the West, the crisis of humanity as we look forward to so-called singularity, and so on and so on. Many people's hearts are failing them for fear, or they're just keeping their heads down and getting on with their own small worlds. But remember, no crisis is so great that God is not greater. God is greater than all. God can be trusted in all situations. Have faith in God. Have no fear. The pandemic will pass. Hopefully the economic crisis will pass. Certainly I hope the moral and political crisis will pass if there's sufficient leadership. But your calling as teachers, will never pass. And I would just say to you with deep gratitude, but also with a certain amount of challenge, keep on with your immense privilege of your profound calling, and may the Lord be with you. Thank you.